Looking back at our own Earth and why we have this rich, you know, biosphere, uh, well, we think it all started with having all this organic material that we are made up of, that that was delivered from space, uh, from comets, and from asteroids. So we were thinking about the likelihood of life elsewhere. We we're pretty much thinking about the likelihood of having that same scenario taking place. In 2015, high on the arid mountains of the Atacama Desert, Professor Karen Oberg set out on a hunt for the building blocks of life in the birth cloud of an alien star system with the help of a new telescope called ALMA. ALMA consists of 66 individual telescopes that's all working together. It operates at millimeter wavelengths. And millimeter wavelengths is where we can detect molecules, some of these organic molecules that we are so interested in. Oberg turned Alma's gaze towards the Taurus system and found the young star MWC 480 in the throes of labor. Girdled by a disk of gas and dust from which planets were being born. We see this dust and gas that's surrounding these, these young stars. And what's even more exciting, we see that they often have little lanes or tracks in them where it looks like plant formation is going on right now. After months of collecting and analyzing the data, Oberg announced a discovery that blew the odds wide open of finding a second genesis on other worlds. In the disk of this alien solar system, Alma had detected some of the same organic molecules that helped give rise to life on Earth. We found three kinds of cyanides, three molecules in the same chemical family. And those three kinds of molecules have also been found in our own solar system in comets. The same organic molecules with the same miraculous potential to create life are out there among the stars. Chemistry is awesome. It's the reason that we are alive and that we're here in the first place. Uh, so far, it's only you know, one system apart from our solar system where we have this chemical information. But my intuition would be that it's going to be very common. This kind of chemistry is going to be almost universal. I scan for sites of geochemical activity. I find a hydrothermal field of fumaroles and hot springs. On Earth, such conditions are rich in carbon chemistry and minerals. I find another mineral-rich water source upstream. I identify complex molecular structure in solution. I extract a sample for analysis. and return it to the lander module. Could this be evidence of life? Hey, let's get the samples in. Yeah. There we go. OK, let's take another measurement. The laws of chemistry and physics are universal. So it's a given that uh, when we go to another Earth-like planet with water, 
With the sorts of uh, minerals that we have here, an iron core, an atmosphere, it's inevitable that this kind of simple chemistry would have been present. Okay, it's uh, 15 degrees up here. Let's see what this little guy has for us. As long as there's a chance for energy to interact with that mixture, things will happen. Wow, look at that. One degree, keep pulling up. The question that we are heading for right now, how certain can we be that that mix of simple chemistry could take the next step in complexity so life could begin? In the hydrothermal fields of Bumpers Hill, California, all the ingredients of life are brought together. Water, carbon molecules, energy, minerals. Careful of the end not coming off. Biologists David Diemer and Bruce Damer believe this is the kind of environment where life could get started on another world. Bubbling pools, strange colored rocks, water of different pHs, all kinds of flows and dynamics, steam rising. It looks like nature's chemistry set. And it's an engine, an actual engine for the beginning of a living system. Conditions like this defined the early Earth. Evidence of similar environments has been found on Mars. And researchers expect hydrothermal fields to be a common feature of Earth-like exoplanets. But how might nature's chemistry set cook up the recipe of life? Everything that's alive is, in fact, based on polymers. Everybody knows the name, DNA, nucleic acid, that's one of the polymers. Proteins, these are uh, amino acid polymers. And th that's basically the start of all life, are those two polymers. So what we're doing is taking small molecules, the pieces of a polymer, called monomers, in fact, and we're exposing them to energy, such as you see here at Bumpus Hill, and seeing where that energy is sufficient to make those monomers link up one after another after another to make a polymer. And in fact, if we can make a protein-like molecule and a nucleic acid-like molecule and put it into a little wrapper, a compartment, we've, we're on the way. We call those protocells. Each sample contains organic molecules, or monomers, exposed to the mineral-rich steam and heat energy of the fumarole in an attempt to form a protocell. We think that drying out, such as you see all around us here at Bumpus Hill, water coming in, then drying out, coming in, drying out, that's a cycle. We think that that cycle was very important to drive the uh, process by which polymers are synthesized and then accumulate. Let's go for it. Failure. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah there's nothing left. Put it down here to cool. Yeah. The first experiment fails, just as it would do many times on an Earth-like exoplanet. But if all the elements were present in conditions such as this, this experiment in life would repeat again and again. Uh, but some of them got a lot of liquid in them. That's one last try. Given enough time, and keep in mind, we have an entire planet with lots of volcanic land masses coming up, uh, with lots of puddles like this trying to learn how to become alive. Mostly it's failures, but it would only take a few successful protocells that happen to be able to survive and had learned how to make more of themselves. So go ahead and get them into the uh, boxes. Is the universe made to make life? This is a, a huge question that sort of beyond the scope of perhaps humans to be able to answer. But 
what we can observe is everything comes down to cycling. It comes to rhythms and overlapping rhythms and patterns. And it's almost as though if you get the right cycling and patterning in a system, it learns how to do that itself and how to lift itself into being. And so perhaps that's the closest metaphor that we know that the geology gave us that ability. The moon going around the earth gave us tides. The rotation of the earth gives us days and nights. Rainfall into these hydrothermal fields gives us geysers that are periodic and life still follows rhythmic patterns. That's the clue we have. So perhaps it's the universal harmonic that creates life. <laughs>